Today we have the pleasure of speaking with former chief of the Tawasin First Nation, Kim Baird, who also happened to negotiate BC's first urban modern treaty in 2009. gave you that, that passion to do the stuff that you've done? I don't know. I mean, um, that's an interesting question. So I grew up uh, in the sort of suburbs of the Lower Mainland, not on our reserve. Oh, not on that one. Okay. And we would visit and, and that kind of thing. And it wasn't until the mid-80s that my mom moved back to the reserve. And when she had... Uh, married, she had lost her Indian status and her rights to the community. So in the mid-80s, Bill C-31 came around and she regained some legal rights. But it was really tough to assert practical rights, moving back to the community where she wasn't necessarily welcome for the choices she'd made as a young woman, all of these things, no housing. Um, and so she was uh, tough and fierce she was, and yeah. resilient. And so she was a, a role model for sure from, from that perspective to really push for what she believed in um, in uh, not easy circumstances. Um, so there's that. There's also the fact that um, for a good part of my childhood, um, after my dad died, we had a pretty transient lifestyle. I went to seven, eight different schools before I graduated. Um, sort of typical sort of not good childhood story um, exposed to alcoholism and um, other sorts of family violence issues and, and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, so that, I think, had something to do with my sense of um, justice, maybe, I don't know. A third component is I grew up with four brothers, so I had to be a feminist um, just by default. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so those are probably big influences to my childhood. And we moved back to the community when I was a teenager, and I had to, um, I was the first uh, to graduate high school in the community in over 20 years or something like that. Really? And so I went to college, and I felt all this pressure that um, I should do something, and I had no idea what to do. And so um, I was taking lots of general arts um, programming, so every all geosophy type of uh, course you could imagine to figure out what I might like. Mm -hmm. And it was th through that, and so I had all these term papers to write, and so I didn't know what I should write on. So I ended up focusing on my community, um, whether it be an English paper doing a general background about the population statistics of the community, or whether it be something else. So then I started researching about Aboriginal rights and title, and the history of colonization in Canada and that kind of thing. And that's when my social and political consciousness woke up. Um, and that's how I began to understand why I was seeing the conditions in my community, um, what the root of that was. And then I also learned that there were potential options of getting out of that. Um, learned about the federal comprehensive plan policy and, and that sort of thing. So that was to your question. No, good answer. I was like, now take a step back a little bit. Tell us a bit more about the reserve itself, the challenges that it faces, or did face, maybe as you grew up. Um, how many, what's the population like? Like you said, you were the first to graduate, so that's a, that's a strong statement in terms of. Yeah, well, I think, so to take a uh, long step back, 
um, pre-contact to us and it was a pretty large settlement. Um, we're Coast Salish First Nation, we numbered in the thousands and then with colonization and smallpox and the sort of uh, scattering of our families, um, we were down to a handful of people at the turn of the um, 20th century. And so since then it's been, uh, um, the, the population's been on a slow climb. Um, after Bill C-31 in the 80s, a lot of members came back, and since then um, the population's been growing more steadily. So I think we're at over 450 now, yeah. small community. Yeah. Um, and when I moved down there, we were probably at about, I would say, 150 maybe, on and off reserve um, youth and adults. Um, so. When I first moved there, there was about 10 houses, I think, maybe 12. Now there's more like 80 or 90 houses, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And the challenges? What What is it like living there? What was the, when well, you grew up? Well, you only went back in the teens, right? When you were yeah, uh, well, and we'd visit a lot, because Trossens and Lower Mainland, and so were we. So yeah. um, my mom would visit her sisters from Freedom. cousins and stuff, but there was no infrastructure at all, no paved road, um, limited uh, other things, like I think they had a party line for the longest time for phone, cable didn't come until the 90s, I don't think, um, that type of thing. Uh, lots of um, socioeconomic sort of issues, poverty, um, lots of drinking, um, that kind of thing. And uh, just didn't look like a little mainland neighborhood that I'd grown up in. Right. And so I wondered what the difference was, right? Why was there sidewalks in the neighboring municipality and not in our community? Just that kind of thing. Because that's pretty much your experience when you're yeah. a youth is sort of the neighborhoods you see your friends in. And Grew up in and the Smiths and the Jones and all that stuff, right? So, um, yeah. So when I moved there, I wondered why there was such a difference. And so then you so going back to you went to university, college, college, sorry. And very soon thereafter, you already got politically involved. Did you not? You how old were you when you first? So I started uh, college at the age of eighteen and. Um, when I learned about the comprehensive land claim process, I approached our chief of the day, and I told him if we ever got a land claim going, I'd be interested in helping out, even if it was on a volunteer basis. And so he co-opted me on the spot to set up a research department for our community, and then I applied for the job. So when I was 20, I became a land claims researcher. Um, and then my evolution within the organization went from there at 22, I got on council, um, and so I always had a dual role since I'm political and uh, as a staff person, sort of uh, carrying the football. Um, although in the early years it uh, was more in a supporting role, and then when I was 28 I became the chief and chief negotiator, um, so uh, then I started actively um, being the person negotiating on Twasson's behalf for the, the agreement, and yeah. How common is it for someone, not only a woman, but of your age, a young age, to be chief? Well, I was the second woman in our community. The, uh, the woman uh, before me was the there first was woman. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know of many women that age that have been chief in Canada. I'm sure there's other examples, and it's changing all the time, but it was an anomaly in that most people don't expect Woman, um, and I'm fairly soft spoken, and uh, to be chief or a negotiator. So um, I uh, did not fit the stereotype in most people's head, I think. Right, right. <laughs> which, which is great. Um, you know, uh, but I read somewhere that initially when you were, um, you took on the role of chief, or even when you first got more politically motivated, that you didn't 
self-governance wasn't necessarily at the top of here. It was more like economic development or, or the treaty, uh, I mean, sorry, land claims that. Yeah. Right? So when I, when I looked at um, the comprehensive planning process mm -hmm. in college and all that, I just thought, well, we're poor, so, you know, resources, cash, and land to develop would seem like obvious fixes yeah. to poverty. Um, but as I progressed through my experience as a leader in trying to work under the Indian Act and uh, our experience of trying to develop a basic condominium unit and the um, war we had with the local municipality and our inability to secure water legally even though we had the pipes already and you couldn't secure it. Uh, for economic development purposes, um, it was mind-boggling to me, right? And it was all about jurisdiction and governance. And the need for the Ministry of Indian Affairs to approve every little thing we did. So it was, and meanwhile, our community was very um, skeptical about the Band Council system, mm -hmm. with good reason that it's not a very good system in my opinion. And I tried my best to improve lines of accountability and transparency, um, but found that it was almost impossible to make much headway because there is just no legitimacy for the whole system in itself. So that internal dialogue of talking about how we wanted to govern ourselves and what would make it better was an uh, integral part of that process. And I often call it our internal reconciliation versus the treaties viewed as external reconciliation with other governments. So they go hand in hand. Um, you need to be ready to take on that jurisdiction and know that your community has the confidence in your system to, to handle it. So, um, yeah, it was a long, long process of a lot of work to do all that engagement. How long a process was it when you first started talking about it and the actual, it was what, 2009 when you actually got it? The, is that your term of the treaty now? Yeah. yeah. So in 2003, the treaty process started was early 2004 when it officially kicked off, but we got a mandate from the community to enter into that process. Um, the amount of money we could borrow to participate in that process, we set up a uh, cross-section of the community to advise us on negotiations, and that committee turned into a group that advised us on the Constitution and still advises the community on um, our legislation and stuff like that. So it was a good um, model. Yeah. But we also did a lot of community meetings and a lot of um, family meetings with families directly in their homes to talk about these issues. And so, you know, the negotiations took about 12 years, I think. And so with every um, stage of the treaty process, we got feedback from the community, whether it be the framework agreement, the agreement of principle, or the final agreement, the community voted on those things. And in addition to that, every year the community had to approve the budget um, for the, the treaty process um, to continue on. So uh, we took uh, engagement super seriously. Yeah. yeah. And it was a long, consistent, persistent discussion. Was there always um, support for that process, or did you have some detractors who didn't think it was the right approach? Well, the, there's detractors to the treaty process, yeah. and to the best um, of our ability, we try to include their participation. Um, it's a, it's hard stuff because it, um, it's very divisive the whole topic, and some people don't think that um, the negotiating with governments is the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so trying to deal with that uh, dissent while advancing as a community is pretty challenging. And the only thing we could do, well, I thought that we could do best to, to do that is just be very open about people's opinions. And um, if we made a decision that was different, that we um, say why um, and make sure everyone know, knew that we've counted in all views decision. Um, I think it's normal for any community to disagree on things. I don't think consensus is on such, something so complex as possible. 
Um, but really, part of our learning and changing as a community is trying to figure out healthy ways to engage in debate um, where people felt safe in voicing their opinion on something that's very controversial. Um, and, you know, I know it's a lot to expect of people. You know, it's a 300 page legal document forever changing our constitutional rights within the Constitution of Canada. It's not the normal discussion at most dinner tables, sure. in my experience, yeah. um, although it's not mine. <laughs> but um, aside from that, like, it's a lot to ask people to take that on. Yeah. And there's a lot of fear and with a lot of good reason, right? So I'm glad we took that long approach to it. Um, and it wasn't perfect. I'm sure there could be lots of things we could have done better. Um, but when you're one of the only, when you're one of the first doing it, you know, it's hard to know, right? So I think everyone just came with that, that spirit or intent of trying to do the right thing and trying to solve um, a really tough issue that our community had been facing for over a century. So. And you said one of the first, I thought it was BC's first urban water treaty. Is yeah, that, but there's lots of, there's lo at that time there's lots of First Nations negotiating treaties in our communities. We're the first to actually make it over the finish line. But okay. Would you say that's one of your more proud moments uh, as chief, as in your, in your political career, in your regular personal and professional life? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the um, ballot count at the community and hearing that it passed was one of life's memorable moments. And everything sort of tied into that. But there's a story about, um, obviously, um, I'm extremely proud of my children as well, right? And there's a funny story that they came along at certain key milestones of the treaty. Yeah. Um, so my uh, oldest came at the agreement principal. My um, second girl came at um, three days after the uh, initial the final agreement. And my third daughter came um, about three weeks after the effective day of the treaty. And so um, she's the first Tawasa child born free of the Indian Act. So all those make um, extremely personal. And the fact that I brought them to work with me, they've been in negotiations, they've been in the legislature, they've uh, been an integral part of um, that part of my career, um, made it even more re rewarding in some ways. Yeah. But another one of my favorite moments is um, when the provincial legislature uh, uh, introduced the settlement legislation. And to welcome my community, they opened the big front doors of the building where up the long set of stairs where usually only the premier or mm -hmm. prime minister was supposed to go through. So it was a symbolic gesture. Um, um, yeah, uh, but important, I think. Um, and so I got to leave my community holding my oldest daughter's hand up those stairs, right? So that that was another moment. Um, I was the first uh, woman to address the legislature that wasn't an MLA, um, or the first uh, Aboriginal woman, I should say. Um, and so, yeah, um, there are lots of things that came with that. But the next phase, as far as, you know, that was the negotiation, but I had no idea that the implementation would be more mm -hmm. grueling um, and intense. So making it to the effective day of our treaty was um, another really proud moment. And the day before the effective day, we had a ceremony to burn the Indian Act. And oh, really? Yeah. What date was that, the effective day? It was April 3rd, 2009. So on April 2nd, that would have been when we had a ceremony to burn the Indian Act. Mm -hmm. and just those sorts of things. I had to get up at midnight to sign my first laws. Um, my ex-husband wasn't terribly happy because I was very, very pregnant with our third daughter. Um, and so uh, luckily uh, I had other members of council that went to go sign all the documents in escrow for the land title office the next day. Um, uh, integrating to the BC land title office was its single largest transaction in its history. So lots of memories with making it work, uh, trying to get the square peg into the round hole and um, just taking over. And the thing about our approach to self-governance is that we hit the ground running. We uh, 
really wanted to use the capacity we built in the negotiations and uh, transition that to taking on as much as we can um, on the effective day. Uh, and we really wanted to get rid of the Indian Act as soon as we could. So, you know, that meant 23 laws on the effective day to replace the Indian Act. That's a lot. Very ambitious. And yeah. we had about 15 months to do that. And that was one of 40 projects we worked on. So um, it was really busy. And, you know, reflecting now on what we got accomplished in such a short period of time, it's, it's remarkable and um, a real testimony to the strength of my team um, who uh, pulled out all the stops to help make it work. And just to make sure you know, that everyone understands what the implications of that treaty is in terms of vis a vis Indian Act is no longer applied at all, or is there? There's uh, some uh, obscure provisions. So um, the determination of whose status or not status is still under the Indian Act. And for anybody um, legally deemed as, um, as a, I can't remember the term, someone who can't take care of their own affairs, there's still residual issue uh, is that, but for the most part, the new uh, governance model is called the concurrent law model. So, both or all three federal, provincial, and First Nation laws apply on the lands at the same time, and the treaty says which laws prevail. And so, if we don't have a law, there's never a vacuum. Um, another jurisdiction will apply to it, but we've really tried to oust as much as the Indian Act is possible. So we. Uh, in the early days to come, very, very um, strong uh, land management types of issues. I was going to ask you about the Order of Canada. It's a bit surreal um, to have been honoured in, in such a way. Uh, uh, and now, um, I don't know, it's just been an interesting year of reflection on, you know, uh, how things are unfolding based on, you know, my team and what we negotiated and how the implementation is going. The other thing is, um, I got the uh, Inspire Award this year as well um, in the field of politics, which you know would be the First Nation equivalent to the Order of Canada. So it's uh, very humbling to be recognized for what we did, and even more so because I know it's been quite controversial. Not everyone agrees to the model. Um, not everyone agrees to reconciliation generally. So. Um, it's, uh, uh, I'm honored to be recognized for being able to lead um, a, an awesome team and the community through such a challenging sort of uh, obstacle course. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And just one last thing you mentioned, not everyone agrees with reconciliation. You obviously feel it a, a worthy goal. Um, and why, why is that so important to you? Well, it's tough, like, uh, when I first learned about the bad history of uh, Aboriginal relations with the federal government, I was so angry, right, and channeling that anger into um, something practical is what I ended up um, focusing my career on. I feel extremely blessed to have been able to work on something for my career that I'm very passionate about. Not everyone's fortunate as that, but, you know, uh, when it came down to it, I'm a very pragmatic person, and so, you know, uh, it's not so much lofty goals of reconciliation that motivated me, but um, more real needs to have autonomy, to make decisions for ourselves, to have a better structure than the Indian, Indian Act, um, and that kind of thing. And, um, we had discussions about whether we were willing to do that uh, within the constructs of Canada or if we wanted to be sovereign. And I think most of my community is quite practical too, and they take comfort in things like the criminal code and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms applying um, and, and that kind of thing, and uh, want to be proud of Canada and want to contribute towards that, um, and really believe in a vision of Canada that will treat First Nations honorably and um, resolve these issues. Um, 
that being said, I don't know, I don't think our agreement's perfect or anything like that, um, but I think it gives us enough tools to um, take control of our lives.